are here with uh, Professor Thomas Seres and Professor William Halle Davis, who are both um, co editors of the uh, Maghrib page on Jadalia. And we are here sitting at the Sorbonne in Paris on July 4th, mm -hmm. which is the glorious day uh, in the United States, but here it's just another day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we also are uh, talking one day before a major uh, protest planned tomorrow in Algeria, as I understand. I hope mm -hmm. that you uh, folks can illuminate uh, mm -hmm. this event coming up. Mm -hmm. And we just would like to take this opportunity of having you together uh, and talk about uh, what is actually uh, happening in Algeria, what is its background and some of the prospects for those of us who have been following the news irregularly and uh, would uh, like to actually have things come together in, yeah. in, a, in, a, in a conversation. This is going to be casual, feel free to interrupt me, interrupt each other, mm -hmm. I might jump in. So uh, I'd like to thank you first for joining us and uh, if you can just share with us uh, some uh, information on, uh, on Algeria and then maybe a little bit about the background and then we'll take it from there. Okay, should I start? Yeah, okay, I will. Uh, well, thank you for uh, having us and to, for giving us the opportunity to give some background and, and speak a little bit about the situation in Algeria. I feel that uh, the first thing to say uh, for a general audience is that it's been no uh, more than 20 weeks uh, that the Iraq in Algeria started and uh, this popular movement of protest, uh, uh, the grassroots, uh, peaceful. Uh, 20 weeks of peaceful protests in the streets, uh, uh, millions of Algerians occupying the public space without major clashes with the police. Um, it's been 20 weeks and um, people are getting tired and uh, the, the global attention, the attention of the world, of the media, of the mainstream media is starting to, uh, to vanish because the global media, the mainstream media have a very limited attention span. But the, 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 the movement is, is still going on, and it's a movement for, basically, uh, very simply, uh, uh, I mean, the absolute rejection of the power structures, social, social justice, and liberty. It's a very simple uh, platform. And for what we have seen so far, uh, the, the, the population is uh, determined to uh, keep going and to, uh, at one point, achieve some kind of, I would say, uh, to give birth to a new Algerian Republic. So this is where we are right now. Any, any, uh, any background you'd like to add to this or any? Sure, for those who maybe haven't been following things quite as closely, um, what precipitated these protests on February 22nd was President Bouteflika's announcement that he was going to run for a fifth mandate. Um, and this is interesting, I think, because Bouteflika as a president has legitimacy from the War of Independence. Algeria fought an extremely violent war against um, French occupation, really. Uh, unlike Morocco and Tunisia, Algeria was a settler colony, so 10% of the Algerian population were Europe of European origin uh, in 1962. And Bouteflika was one of these revolutionary combatants that defeated France. Mm -hmm. And so what's also happening that's interesting from a historical point of view is the moment of independence in 1962, um, which succeeded in defeating the French, also posed a lot of questions, questions about Berber identity, questions questions about um, the place of opposition movements, of communists, for example. And so a lot of, a lot of what we've been seeing is not only a kind of rejection of Bouteflika, mm -hmm. who has been incapacitated for years. Bouteflika cannot give a speech. He had a, a stroke, um, I believe, in 2013. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and so he's been absent himself from the political scene. And the insult of seeing somebody who's supposed to represent a revolutionary nation in a wheelchair who's not able to speak, um, to say nothing about his capacity to, go to govern, has really been at the heart of a lot of these protests, along yeah. with this discussion about um, the founding moment of Algerian history, which was decolonization and the war of independence. Mm -hmm. And if I may uh, ask you, Mariam, um, from what I have been following, not just now, but recently, there is a sort of uh, uh, particular response to what happened in the 1990s. I mean, the violence of the 1990s yes. uh, has put people on edge and made them uh, somewhat resistant or somewhat uh, careful in terms mm -hmm. of uh, reigniting something similar, which mm -hmm. a lot of people say affected how Algerians 
uh, calculated whether to go to the streets and so on. Not right now necessarily, but maybe in the 2000s and mm -hmm. the lead up to the Arab right. uprisings. Is this does this figure in any of this, or it is it, it's just time to go beyond it? Absolutely, and I would um, maybe say a few words and then let Thomas take this question since his book is really about the legacy of the civil war in Algeria. But when I started doing research in Algeria in 2011 and the rest of the Arab world was having the, and I don't like the term, but the quote unquote Arab Spring, um, and Algerians don't like the term either, and they would tell me, well, we already had our Arab Spring, but it was October 1988, when for the first time the legitimacy of the one party state, maybe not for the first time, but in a kind of very visible way, the legitimacy of the one-party state was questioned, met with extreme state violence, um, and the elections, which looked like the Islamists were going to win, um, were canceled by the army, hmm. thereby setting in motion a very violent um, civil war that pit not only the army against Islamists, but really factions of people within those blocks against each other. And so the Algerians know what it is to go up against a state, and the rallying cry of this movement has been Silmiya, that it's peaceful, it's hmm. peaceful. And one of the kind of amazing things that we've seen, which is really the result of years of organizing and um, kind of civil society uh, helping people to understand what it means to protest, is, you know, people forming physical barriers with the police, people cleaning up the streets after protests, people giving out bottles of water, people feeding other protesters. Mm -hmm. So the lessons of the Civil War um, are not just be careful of the state, it can be very violent, but how do you get public attention to your movement so that the police and the state cannot crack down on you, right? How do you make that um, a choice that they will not politically make due to a calculation on what violence they can and cannot use? And so um, that would be my kind of historical take on the character and slogans of this movement and, and the kind of tactics they've used to organize mm. the Tuma you might have. Thomas, yeah. I want to ask you later about your book, but before you continue, can you tell us what the title is at least and um, what, we, what when should we expect um, it? In French or in English? Uh, in French, l'Algérie face à la catastrophe suspendue. Pardon? L'Algérie face à la catastrophe suspendue, gérer la crise, blâmer le peuple dans l'Algérie de Bouteflika. And in English, it will be something like Algeria facing the suspended disaster, uh, managing the crisis and blaming the people in Bouteflika's Wow, Algeria. it's long. I, I thought you were starting to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you need the column. You need the column. It's an academic book. It's, great. it's not supposed and to be read. And I'll ask you about it if you don't mind after. Or we can speak about not the, the idea, at least, that is in the book right now, because it's absolutely uh, 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 in, the, in the line of what you are saying, uh, Mariam. So there is definitely, and this is very important, what you just said, this idea that, uh, especially uh, like from the 2000 and like, yeah, 2005, 6, 7 onwards, in Algeria, uh, there is a situation where uh, social unrest is still there, overwhelming, the rejection of the state is uh, growing because for the first two mandates of Bouteflika there was some kind of consensus because Bouteflika in a way makes, made sense. He made sense as uh, a figure of authority who can speak, who can act for the benefit of the nation in the sense that yes, he brought peace back, he was able to stabilize the power structure which was a huge achievement because I mean uh, uh, ending these uh, never-ending power struggles in the state was something uh, that the, the, I think the Algerian people really needed. So Bouteflika did that. At the same time, um, the, 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 wide, the widespread feeling that the, the, the promises of 1962, this idea of social justice, this idea of uh, uh, redistribution of wealth, but also of dignity, uh, were absolutely missing in the way in which uh, the state related to the population and the way in which the population felt that uh, the society was organized led to this uh, ongoing movement of, of protest. And because of the fragmentation inherited from the civil war, these protests were led most of the time to like, forms of riots, uh, uh, urban violence, because society was extremely fragmented and the best way to enter in a direct confrontation with the state was rioting. It was a very efficient way to actually make a statement and the state responded to this statement by saying, okay, well, you have a problem, you're burning public, uh, public buildings, well, we will give you money. So this uh, situation kind of uh, fed the feeling of anomia this idea that Algeria was 
again facing some kind of catastrophic situation and a new civil war was a possibility. And at the same time, what you just said is essential because in 2006, 7, 8, you have these new movements that appear that clearly think about resistance in, in a way that is, I mean, it's clearly stated, based on the revolution, revolutionary experiences in Latin America, in Eastern Europe, in Asia. So this idea that we need to find a way to uh, defeat the state without giving, giving them an opportunity to use mass violence. We need to think about pacifism. And for the last 10 years in Algeria, you have all these movements, trade unions, uh, um, Bon, associations of the civil society, uh, movement of unemployed workers, uh, movement of women, who tried to think about uh, uh, um, civil disobedience, about a revolution that would actually defeat the state without giving them the opportunity to replicate the civil war. And it was fragmented because Algeria is a huge country and because of the civil war. And this election, the one that was uh, scheduled for April uh, 2019, gave the opportunity for a reunion, for coming together of all these movements, all these experiences, in one single mobilization, mm -hmm. multi-sectoral, that is, we can say it now, a revolution. Mm -hmm. um, and if we want to talk about uh, some of the history uh, of Algerian uh, political economic uh, development, mm -hmm. To what extent can we uh, trace some of the uh, resentment mm. to, to particular policies that actually mm. either created polarization mm. or mm -hmm. uh, benefited some groups as opposed to others and perhaps even mm. consolidated certain uh, strata or, or classes? Mm. Mm. Or is this something that uh, doesn't figure as much in the Algerian mm. situation? Mm. I think that the economic question in Algeria is completely tied to the social and political question. So when Algerians won independence, they were very clear that there was no political independence without economic independence. Um, and the first two presidents, Ahmed Ben Bella and then Hori Boumedien, saw third worldism as a way for the Algerian economy to exist with some autonomy from the world system. And Algerians also came to expect certain things of their state. They expected a kind of revolutionary socialist state that would provide them with housing and health care. Um, and much like we saw in other parts of the region, in Tunisia and Egypt, uh, the structural adjustment policies that were just before October 88 started to put that in question in, in very violent ways. You have the same kind of um, uprisings for basic food stuffs when the World Bank uh, and IMF policies were introduced. I think Algeria now, um, and perhaps here Toma can take over, is it's more complicated than places like Tunisia and Morocco in that the neoliberal model has never completely won. Um, Algerians still have a notion of um, economic sovereignty. That's not to say that, it, that the market has not become a major force, but they coexist in a kind of strange way. Um, and then the other thing about economic redistribution in Algeria, I would say, which, you know, again, you see this in Tunisia, is a really um, stark difference between the North and the South. And so one of the movements that Thomas was just talking about, the unemployed of the South, um, has coexisted with other movements in the South, an anti-fracking movement, for example. And much like in other places in North Africa, the resources, I mean, think about the Western Sahara, the res resources are in the South. Um, and so these populations feel um, marginalized culturally, um, but they also feel marginalized because their resources have been used uh, and plundered by the state. So there is a geographic as well, well as kind of historical gap between how mm. wealth has been used, I would say. Mm. Um, and more recently, Bouteflika's model um, has been a kind of hybrid, but maybe mm. that's something you can... But yeah. the hybridity, uh, did it... Uh, sort of mitigate the production of a new uh, group or class that became the objective, for instance, in many, uh, or in some at least other cases where the uh, polarization that this sort of class uh, made visible became an object of the uprising? Mm. Uh, or did, uh, and or uh, is it that the uh, uh, lack of sort of Algeria being overtaken by new mm. liberal policies or similar kinds of policies uh, pr uh, preserved the public sector perhaps mm. and its provision of uh, goods and services and mm. so on, subsidies and so on. Is, 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 are these some of the reasons why it didn't really uh, 
take well, place? Well, I mean, th there is in Algeria, as it is the case in Tunisia or in Egypt or in, in Syria, uh, there is a class of chronic capitalists that is here, that is a direct conse consequence of these uh, successive wave of liberalization in the 1980s and 1990s. And I mean, the program of pri privatization implemented by the government at the end of the 1990s was based on some kind of very uh, 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 shady deals. Uh, and uh, I think that the, the institution in charge of, of, of uh, uh, organizing the, this, this, I mean, dismantlement of public companies was under direct supervision of the government and the presidency, and it led to uh, uh, the, I mean, the constitution of uh, huge uh, uh, economic empires, uh, especially in the in the, the field of or in the sector of uh, the food industry, um, construction, transportation, this kind of, of sectors of the economy. So all of these figures of this new private economy. Uh, uh, have been seen in Algeria with a lot of suspicion for obvious reasons. Uh, somebody like uh, Ali Haddad, for example, uh, one of the uh, uh, wealthiest men in Algeria. Ali Haddad? Ali Haddad. Ali? Oh, Ali, Ali Haddad is my brother. <laughs> uh, maybe there is a connection. You don't have an Ali? I don't know. I don't know if your brother has some connections with Algeria. That's. Uh, <laughs> In that case, he's in jail. I'm sorry to. Oh, <laughs> and our sal and our uh, fee for this interview also just went up. In that case, uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, Ali Haddad or other uh, well-known chronic capitalists in Algeria were seen as uh, members of this ruling elite. Uh, uh, and when the Algerian people is right now in the street uh, 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 denouncing the Isaba, the the, the 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 clan or the gang that took over the state. They clearly mention first, um, they had in mind all these political elites and political and bureaucratic elites in the presidency, in the ruling parties, but also, I mean, members of the military elite and businessmen. And these businessmen uh, are no, most of them sleeping in jail. They were arrested over the last couple of months. And I think that it's pretty obvious. It's a way for the army to, ta to somehow uh, 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 control this, uh, these demands for change to show that yes there was some kind of corruption but look we have identified these actors everybody uh, knew their names so it's not that difficult to actually say the brother Kuninev, Ali Haddad, uh, 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 Mayedin Takut all of these names uh, figures of this like chronic capitalism in Algeria were arrested as a way to um, yes organize a return to order and in a way normalize the uprising. Uh, I would like to ask you about three things and you can select whatever uh, you'd like to address. Uh, the relationship between Algeria, you talked about this a little bit, and the Arab uprisings, mm. and how people feel, as you said, uh, that we've had ours, you know, a uh, couple, a few decades ago. Mm. But in general, if, if, whether whether there is something uh, more to add to the question of the, that relationship in terms of how um, uh, perhaps uh, it either spurred or uh, provided you know uh, some sort of models or somehow added to the imagination of Algerians that's the first uh, you know dimension the second is uh, to what extent do you find that the Algerian and the Sudanese protests right now are either feeding off of each other or synergizing and clearly they're not connected in terms of you know there is on that I mean they have their own mm. pieces but 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 now that they are simultaneously taking place is there anything to say about uh, perhaps connections maybe the, the, the protest movement mm. connecting or or mm. not I'm, I'm not sure I'm not sure if you're uh, also uh, you know if you'd like to address that the mm. third dimension is given that Tunisia and Egypt have had their own uprisings whether or not they were successful mm. or however we measure success in this case is less than we don't have to talk about this but they've mm. had their uprisings however Morocco seems to be firmly in place and uh, mm. obviously as a function in part of the quick response that the king and the establishment mm. uh, uh, basically embarked on mm. directly around January and February of 2011 mm. yeah. Now, uh, it does uh, uh, is what we are seeing in Algeria 
in any way, shape, or form uh, uh, affecting the, 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 the Moroccan uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, aura of stability. So mm-hmm. these three things, please feel free to address either. Yeah, I'll jump in on the last one um, with a kind of unsatisfactory response, which is that it is it and it isn't. So on the one hand, the fact that both movements are calling themselves the Hirak is not incidental. And certainly one of the things that we have seen um, is quite a bit of solidarity among countries in North Africa that have historically not gotten along politically, Mm. Morocco and Algeria, which have a closed border, which are still fighting over the Western Sahara, and which have kind of deep historical political disagreements. Um, And the other thing is that they both come from very different political cultures with very different kinds of systems of legitimacy. So, and you can see this not only, I think, in the current events, but how both countries have dealt with the question of um, the Amazigh population, for example. Mm -hmm. And so Morocco has always been able to co-opt certain strands of opposition Mm -hmm. under the kind of rubric of Allah al-Watan wal-Malek, right? So God is king and country, um, or sorry, not God is king and country, king is king, Allah, well, Mm. God is is king and country. Allah al-Watan wal-Malek, so yes. And so that's allowed them to bring people under this tent of the monarchy and give them a a large measure for co-optation, which Algeria, which has a kind of national culture of the people being one and unit, you know, unified in that oneness, um, does not have. And so Mm -hmm. the the question that right now um, it's right, um, one only one hero, un seul hero, le peuple in Algeria is kind of one of the rallying cries mm-hmm. that goes back to 1962. Um, and that gives them a different kind of imaginary of protest than mm-hmm. the Moroccan Herak, which is a which is also right based in the reef and a long history of mm-hmm. marginalization. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when Hassan Dur became president, the, the, the big bitter question was that he never went to the reef um, to mm-hmm. visit the region. And so these are longstanding um, ethnic, linguistic, um, and economic questions in Morocco, but ones that have been to a certain extent co-opted Uh, by the regime making certain constitutional reforms and the king being um, a figure that is above all, you know, not able to be um, contested directly. And you can see that in how, right, the PGD or the the Islamic Party, um, the PGD, the People's Justice and Development Party, Mm -hmm. has been co-opted. The Party for Justice and Development. Party for Justice and Development. All these languages and acronyms are. (laughs) um, And so so there are different models, I think, for thinking about protest. Um, And even though there are points of resonance, I would be hesitant to say that there's a kind of direct importation of the same model. Mm. Um, the same way that, you know, Algerians will say, and, you know, we're not we're not Egypt, we don't have the same relationship to our army as Egypt, um, and that is, uh, Algerians are quite insistent on having their own temporality uh, and their own kind of um, consciousness mm-hmm. of their sovereignty and nation state. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's true that if we try to think about what is happening uh, in uh, what has happened in Morocco over the last uh, three years and uh, try to see some kind of connection with Algeria, there is obviously the question of the, the Herak as a name, then the fact that it's located in some kind of peripheral, yet central symboli- symbolically region, uh, the Reef, uh, in a way could lead us to kind of think of a comparison between the Black, the, the black Spring of 2001 in Kabylia, which is a central moment uh, for this history of protest in Algeria, uh, which was also brutally repressed, and which started also uh, after the, the death of uh, a young man well, uh, killed by the by the state uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a gendarmerie. But well, this comparison is, as like every comparison, limited. Uh, it's always limited. Uh, and and uh, each of these movements have their own temporality, their own reasons, and the fact that there is a source of legitimacy for the Moroccan state, which is the Marseille and a certain history or a certain narrative of this uh, 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 past to independence. When in Algeria, the, the, the main source of legitimacy is the people. It is the people, and without the people, there is no legitimacy historically. That's a period. And, and the idea, the only possibility for a legitimate political actor to exist in the public space is to constantly refer to the political sanctity of the people. Of the people. So uh, there is this idea of political sanctity is extremely powerful. And in a society, and what is absolutely fascinating with Algeria, and I think that it's not the case with Morocco, in Morocco, the state is still able to produce uh, uh, meaning. And when you try to speak with uh, 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 
the Moroccan, the Moroccan elites, they can make sense of the situation. And uh, I was uh, speaking with a colleague who works in Morocco. When you try to interact with Moroccan bureaucrats, they will have a discourse that makes sense. But this in Algeria was not possible anymore. This in Algeria stopped the, 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 the ability of the state to produce meaning disappeared with the, the black decade. Their only meaning was it's either us or absolute chaos. And you don't produce legitimacy with these kind of discourses. You just create some kind of standoff, a situation where people are just constantly facing uh, some kind of, of, of uh, apocalypse, a potential apocalypse. And you, do, you don't govern this way. You, you, you threaten people. And this kind of government, based on fear and non-meaning, uh, on, on confusion or uncertainty, mm -hmm. Technically, uh, creates absolute cynicism. It's I mean, only sustainable in a society that. And maybe uh, just let me finish. That is absolutely, if I, you don't mind. Yeah. Okay. If that is no, but that's important. That is absolutely cynical, and absolute cynicism doesn't uh, uh, coexist with sanctity. Yeah. The idea of sanctity, in a way, is, I mean, the ultimate uh, a counter discourse to cynicism as a way to organize society. So when you, when you mentioned all these businessmen, this new uh, economic elite, the only values that they were able to offer, given the fact that their success, their economic success, was a consequence of the Marifa, of the fact that they had connections with the state, was, well, we are, we are, there is something to eat, let's eat it. Absolute cynicism. This is not a discourse that is sustainable. In, in opposition to this, cynicism and this absurdity which was essential to this Algerian uh, ruling coalition, well, this idea of the people united, revolutionary, and in a way holy, existed, survived to the Black Decade, survived to 20 years of Bouteflika, and ended up, uh, in, a, in a way, flooding the public space. And come back to the idea that this is what makes the specificity of this Algerian moment? Yeah, at the same Sorry. time, I would say that maybe two things. One, despite the emergence of this unified people, we do see uh, questions of disagreements in the public space. And a lot of mm. that was bottled with um, the end of the civil war, reconciliation, um, the idea, the way that Bouteflika was able to end the civil war was basically to say, we've turned the page, we're not going to ask questions about what happened, um, and we're not going to interrogate our own history. And so one of the things that's been interesting, just to give one example, is when Gaid Salah at one point tried to make it illegal and crack down on the Berber flag in protests, there was a question about, are Islamists going to come to the defense of uh, the Berber activists or just people on the street who might have a Berber flag? And so these kinds of uh, factions that existed historically um, when um, you know, one of the number two member of the FIS uh, was buried in Algiers a few weeks ago, he had passed away in Qatar, I think, mm -hmm. uh, and the question was, who's going to come out? Uh, Madani. Uh, so one of sorry, one of the leaders of the FIS. Um, I always thought he was number two to Bashar. Um, was there was a question about in the streets of Algiers, regardless about um, who, how many people were there for the funeral. What does that mean for the future of the Hirak? And mm -hmm. so. Uh, these symbols that are coming back out on the street, some of them are historic nationalist leaders that the FLN had said had not been heroes but traitors. Uh, Masali Hajj, for example, who is one of the mm -hmm. founders of Algerian nationalism, but for the FLN was an absolute enemy um, and had no space in Algerian history books. You see pictures of him on the street. So it's both, mm -hmm. I think what's interesting about the movement is it's both a moment of the people as a hero together and of different strands of Algerian history that up until the present have not been given voice mm -hmm. in the public mm -hmm. space. And I think it's hard for people who haven't um, been to Algeria or aren't following Algeria, you know, kind of with the same intensity that we are, that we are and have been, um, to understand the absurdity of everyday life. Um, so for a while there was this notion that there was a handful of generals that controlled everything in Algeria. Le pouvoir was, were these uh, members of the DRS, which has now been dissolved. And the god of Algeria, um, 
Tofik Medien, mm. there was only one photo of him in circulation, and it was this horrible kind of Polaroid fuzzy photo. So imagine living in a country where people say that this one man controls everything. He's the real power, but you don't really know what he looks like. Um, the fact that when Bouteflika went to vote for himself, he couldn't actually put the ballot in the box, right? There was kind of a young boy who had to vote for him. So these kind of his nephew. So there were these kinds of uh, moments of absolute absurdity that I think speak to what Thomas was saying about the inability to produce um, even a kind of superficial political legitimacy. Mm. I mean, just the absolute kind of in-your-face disrespect that the Algerian regime has had for its people um, has been something that's both, uh, right, the notion of hogra and of, um, of being Dis, the, despite, or the, how would you translate Hogra? The um, denial of justice, of the right to exist, uh, to live with dignity as a man. As, yeah. Uh, and it's yeah, all of these things, yeah. right? Yeah. As well as the absurdity of the political system combined. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of personal experience of the authorities having this profound um, disrespect for you and your own inability uh, to make sense of what's happening with your political system. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> and. Uh, so how, how might we understand the relationship then, or how should we, uh, between the, the uprisings and uh, which happened eight, eight years ago and mm. what is happening out here, or maybe there is not much there there. Mm. Same thing with the question of connection between mm. Sudan, mm -hmm. the Sudan activism mm -hmm. and protests and the Algerian. So if I might say something about Sudan first. Unfortunately, uh, there is a connection between all these uprisings and the, the, the Iraq in Morocco, the uprising in Sudan, and the Iraq in Algeria. It's the same motivation. Uh, people just want respect, some kind of freedom, the right to sh somehow choose their leader, and social justice in a way or another. So all of these motivations are, that are essential, that are in a way common to, I mean, everybody, <laughs> exist in the Middle East, and the fact that life was unbearable is unbearable and cannot uh, remain unbearable is a, a very good reason to start a revolution. This was the case in 2010 in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Tunisia. It was the case in 2019 in Algeria. Obviously, the violence of the regime is extremely different. Uh, the violence of the Syrian regime is uh, impossible to match in North Africa for historical reasons, for sociological reasons too, and also because, and this is what needs to be taken into account when we think about the relationship between Sudan and Algeria, the Middle East is a place of systematic interference, direct interference, mm. and you end up with a succession of proxy wars in this, re in this region. When you look at the Algerian civil war in the 1990s, there is no direct in interference in Algeria. There, is, there, is, there are definitely forms of interference, but this is not a proxy war. This is happening in Algeria with Algerian actors. So you're talking about the interference of the Gulf and Egypt in, Gulf, the, in the, the Sudan? The US, the US, Russia, Turkey. Yeah. Russia. In, you look at Syria right now, everybody is interfering. You look at the situation in Egypt. The Syrian army has, doesn't have the economic material means to control the country without the constant support of the US and Saudi Arabia and the, Emir and the Emirates. Same thing with Sudan. So these countries has, have been poisoned by interference. The failure of the Egyptian revolution, the failure of the Syrian revolution, the failure, and I don't like to speak about failure, but let's face it, uh, and the, the huge difficulties faced by the Sudanese revolutionaries are not the consequences of domestic structures. Obviously, local actors are responsible for their choices. They are adults and they make choices that might be debated and, or, 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 or denounced. But the systematic interferences are what poison these movements. Luckily for Algeria, the tradition of non-interference has been kind of remarkable when you think of it, over the last 50 years. And currently, the simple idea of having the Emirates interfering to give money to the army will be the mm. end for the Algerian army. And that's one of, been one, of the, one of the things you see in the protests are no to interference, no France, no UAE, um, no US, uh, they're very clear about, um, and those slogans are usually in French or in English, uh, and they want them to be circulated. I, we saw we went to the Hirak protest. And these are the actual protesters. Yeah, yeah, we're saying you know no, no to Not the Gulf. Not even on their side. 
they have they have said no, that. Don't no, interfere on don't interfere. Side. This yeah, is our exactly. this is our this is our deal. And not not not, not like. For instance, the Syrian situation where mm-hmm. everybody interfered on all sides mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. at some level. And what is interesting that in a way the protesters, when they write their signs, they write in English, in French, uh, in Fossa, in Dalija. So they are, in a way, absolutely extraverted. They are speaking to the world, and there is a real consciousness that what has been said over the last, the past 20 years about Algeria was unfair and untrue. So we need to write this wrong and we need to recreate some kind of narrative that we control. So they speak to the world, but the world has no place as a political actor in Algeria because Algeria is a fiercely sovereignist nation. And uh, like currently, the protesters are, are, are singing Gait Salah, uh, Shiat al Emirat. So you're, you're a servant of the Emirates. Mm. The army is already under pressure. They're, and this, they're shouting this to whom? In the streets. Referring to Kaid Salah, who is with the, the chief of staff of the Algerian army. So, yeah. currently the most powerful man in Algeria. Yeah. Uh, but somebody like Kaid Salah will never end up uh, being president. Uh, he will never be a CC because the Algerian army has no interest in that, too. And so this is a huge difference. So, the structure of the army, the interest of the army in direct control, the, 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 the foreign support that the army enjoys is completely different. And then also, I think it's fair to say it, the army had its experience in shooting at its own people in the 1980s and 1990s, and it was traumatic for them too. And and what is happening right now in Sudan, I, I firmly believe that it could not happen in Algeria. Hmm. It could not happen in Algeria. And this is something that should uh, 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 give hope that at least in Algeria, the non uh, Deadly. I'm not saying that it's non non-violent because the, the police state is violent, but at least they are not killing people, and it's a huge difference. Uh, thank you, Muriam. You um, uh, edited a volume, a short volume titled "The Afterlives of the Algerian Revolution" mm-hmm. in uh, in the in Jad Mag magazine mm-hmm. uh, a few years back. Uh, if you were to update this this volume. Uh, after the current situation in Algeria, mm. uh, w- w- what would you do? I would predict a revolution that starts on the 22nd of February 2019, for okay. sure. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, as historians of something, you're always looking for traces of it. And so I was certainly guilty of reading Algeria through the prism of the War of Independence and symbols and contests around that because it served my interest in terms of what I work on. Um, but Having said that, this language is so present in Algeria, the question of, this, of the War of Independence. Um, I was there for the 50th anniversary of the War of Independence, and what was interesting then is that you know, there were people who were using those, um, those tropes, and other people who were saying, we've had enough of them. We don't want to hear about this, the War of Independence anymore. And I think um, what, I, what I didn't really see at that time was it wasn't we've had enough of those tropes, we don't want to hear about them, it's we've had enough of those tropes, we want to use them for our own purposes. And so I think what we're seeing is not just a reutilization of the tropes or a rejection, uh, but really a reappropriation. And so what I couldn't have foreseen was the kind of amazing creativity of these protesters in taking these themes I had been interested in, taking these echoes I had been tracing and using them um, in really creative ways that question the foundation of the Algerian state. Um, and so, I, but having said that, I think a lot of the things that we wrote about in that volume uh, are coming out in interesting ways in on the streets, in slogans, questions of economic justice, uh, questions of um, right fighting for the martyrs of the Algerian revolution. You still see that quite a bit on the streets as well. So it, it hasn't gone away. It's just that the protesters want to use them themselves mm-hmm. rather than having the state always deploy them mm-hmm. to control mm-hmm. um, the population. Thank you. Uh, the last round, very quickly. And I'm going to prejudice uh, uh, by accent mm-hmm. uh, because I'm not sure yes. if you know you do have an accent. I, I do. Accent. I do. Uh, and, and, you know, you, you also have a specific accent anyway. It's a better one. Anyway. Yeah. So I'm going to ask Please you about see. the responses in both France and the United States to the situation in Algeria. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm going to prejudice by accent, as in you address the U.S. and, okay. and uh, I mean, William will address the U.S. Yeah. and and, and uh, Thomas will address. 
in France, but you can also go back and forth mm -hmm. in terms of the responses, especially especially in France, because mm -hmm. we, uh, we we don't hear very much actually uh, where we're sitting. Uh, mm -hmm. Not now. Now we're at the Sorbonne, we're in Paris, mm -hmm. and all of that. Mm -hmm. But from the United States, uh, you know, I haven't. We haven't been able to catch like a very specific line on on where mm -hmm. the French policy, U.S. Yeah. Uh, French foreign policy stands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, in that tradition of non-interference, the U.S. has always kept a low profile in Algeria, even if Algeria has been an important site of anti-terrorism and security policies. The U.S. has a very fraught relationship um, with Algeria in terms of Algeria refuses to be another place where the U.S. can kind of um, can kind of impose its vision for the region. So th I think. From what I've been able to understand, um, should we? No, this is this is French this? interference in yeah, the yeah. Algerian yes. revolution. No, yeah. we should actually we, we? don't. We don't uh, edit. Just okay. either repeat, go forward. Okay. March on. Okay. Um, marching on. So I think that the U.S. is has been keeping a low profile, and I think that that's what it, you know. It's not my mm. job to sit, to dictate U.S. foreign policy, but I think it has absolutely no credibility yeah. in the region. Been amazing. If I mean, yeah, yeah I really should have done something else with that mass degree. You should yeah. do that, please. Um, <laughs> Maybe it's not too late. If I don't get tenure, we'll see what happens. Um, but I think that that's the right line for them to follow. And I also don't really think that the U.S. understands much about what's happening in, Al in Algeria. I don't think they really understand the history. Um, and that's also because of kind of lack of access and perhaps also a laziness in understanding a country that's really unlike other countries in the region. Hmm. Um, and Paris? Paris. Let's speak about the U.S. first. Because, I mean, if there is one uh, commonality uh, between France and the U.S. is that their main focus when it comes to Algeria is security, uh, the control of populations and, and population flows. And when it comes to that, when the U.S. speak with the Algerian government, they speak with the military. So, and also the only one that they can understand are the military. So there is an actual cooperation between, between the U.S. government and the, the Algerian military, especially in the Sahara, in the framework of this counter-terrorist struggle. Paris has a very different relationship with uh, uh, Algiers for uh, obvious reasons. It's much more political, it's much, much more problematic historically, and there is also a question of actual complicity between the French and the Algerian, Algerian elites. Uh, even if, and this is important to, 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 to say it, some of the most corrupt members of the, 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 the successive governments in Algeria under Bouteflika uh, uh, studied and were trained in the U.S. and when they had to invest their money, they invested it in Canada and in, in, in the U.S. Shakib uh, Khalil, when he had to leave Algeria uh, for a huge uh, story of corruption, uh, he was the, the Minister of Energy, he went straight to the U.S. So this is something important, and Algerians know it. Uh, so that's something to say. Obviously, the, the, the complicity between France and, and Algeria is much deeper historically and in terms of also sociological uh, 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 connections and, uh, and education. But France has the same kind of problems in the sense that the Algerian state is fiercely uh, sovereignist. They don't want to. They don't want any kind of interference. And I think that they are able to um, limit these uh, connections and these uh, exchanges, um, so they are made in their own, own terms. So they have some kind of control when it comes to what they will give to the French government and what the French government can expect. And what I've seen uh, when I like, discussed these, these issues with uh, members of the, the, the French diplomacy or these kind of things, that they end up struggling like everybody to understand what is actually going on in the, 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 the state uh, structure in Algeria. So I feel that at this point, when they look at the situation currently in Algeria, they don't understand anything. Or at least they don't understand it, they don't understand it better than us. Which is really good because I think we are both specialists, so they have a good idea. But when it comes to these internal struggles, they are puzzled like everybody. And when it comes to the state of Algerian society, I would say that unlike the US, France has a lot of prejudice for obvious reasons. So they know a lot about Algeria, but the way they read it is very specific. It's obsessed with this idea of 
uh, a cultural struggle uh, uh, between these modernist elites who s- that are allegedly speaking French, and who are allegedly speaking French, and these uh, Islamized, Arabized uh, masses that are impossible to control and that are uh, kind of trapped by some kind of Islamist manipulation. Really, they think like this? Unfortunately, this dualist representation of Algeria in France is dominant, and it is important to underline the fact that this representation is also fueled by uh, Algerian intellectuals who left Algeria for very good reasons. They were threatened, and they faced, I mean, uh, government harassment, repression, uh, censorship, uh, threats, physical threats, in the 90s, actual murders, And when they arrived in France, they, 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 they expressed uh, this distress, and it's absolutely normal. The thing is that these discourses coming from Algeria, when they arrive in France, they do not echo the actual experience of these intellectuals in Algeria. They echo the underlying racism that is inherent to the way in which public debates about the Middle East, about North, North Africa, and especially about Algeria, are framed in France. And, and sadly, We speak and hear a lot about Algeria, but we end up reproducing these pre-established frameworks because it fits our prejudice. I wonder where the prejudice is coming from. Maybe, maybe it's the 130 years of colonialism. I think it's the water. I don't know. The water, the water. The, the water. It's either the water yeah. or, or the cheese. Water, no, it's the cheese. Yeah, it's the yeah, cheese. Yeah. It's colonialism. It's <laughs> obvious. Thank you for noticing it. I, At one point, you don't. You, you do, don't. Do you feel guilty at all, Thomas? Uh, your country personally, yeah. Screwed I screwed up the country. Yeah. I, I, I feel terrible. <laughs> Would you about, like to present your apologies? My apologies. To the yeah, people? I'm absolutely fine with that. Apologies to the Algerian people in the name of the French state. Absolutely. <laughs> well, responsible. Macron might have another I don't know idea if I have the right that, to do it, but <laughs> I'm really sorry. And uh, you, you need to ask for reparations. You deserve it. Actually, that is one place, like in terms of you know reparations, that actually makes sense. Well, uh, let me just. This uh, needs to be edited. Let me make sense. Let me. Makes that not make sense. Let me uh, uh, close by asking you if you would like to close with, with anything in particular, uh, not least tomorrow's protest. Because uh, the tomorrow's mm. protest, if, yeah. if it spins everything out of control, mm. this means we either have to redo this uh, whole interview. Yeah. Uh, but I need to get a promise from both of you, although you will be here tomorrow, we will be here, we can speak with you, but I know you're traveling, yeah. so I need to get a promise from you on camera. Can we call you tomorrow if something really odd takes place and talk for a little bit on Skype? No. Under no circumstances tomorrow I'm seeing my sister and my nieces and they have the priority. So sorry, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry people are interested in Algeria, but I will be uh, with my status, sister. by the way, status podcast. Oh. Not, not Sorry, I didn't know who I was talking to. So, <laughs> so we have been, I've been framed, and that's fine. <laughs> But uh, yeah, any closing statements and, and, and what mm. might happen tomorrow? I mean, I wouldn't uh, venture to say what might happen mm. tomorrow. Is um, the 5th of July in Algeria kind of in our American 4th of July is their 5th of July. It's a big national um, holiday mm-hmm. for independence. And that is dovetailing with a moment where, from what I've been hearing from friends here in France who've been to Algeria recently, um, that they're worried that there are less people showing up for the protests. They're worried that the government crackdowns are starting to have effects on the protesters. They're worried what the government might do after already. Um, right, there are 30, around 30 people who are, have been put in jail for protesting in Algeria. This has not gone without any kind of crackdown by the authorities. So there is um, a worry about that and also a worry that the international community um, isn't paying attention anymore and this mm-hmm. might be the moment for the government to do something that mm-hmm. um, otherwise it wouldn't do. Having said that, I don't, you know, I, I have no way of seeing how reasonable or not that is, but that is a worry from actors on the ground mm-hmm. I've spoken to. Um, what I think is is quite certain is that I expect there will be people, as in every mm-hmm. 5th of July um, in Algeria, there are people, and given what's been going on, I think we'll see another Friday, like we've been seeing since mm-hmm. the 22nd of February, perhaps even more people, but mm-hmm. people are on edge. I mean, this is not, uh, it doesn't take a kind of genius to follow Algerian social media, to talk with friends. People are on 
edge in a way that at least I haven't gotten the sense for um, quite some time. There was one protest. Quite some time since the beginning. Since the beginning. I would say three weeks in when it was very unsure, there was one protest that started happening at night and protests at night kind of immediately draw one back to the Civil Mm. War and people were stressed about Mm. that. Um, but they're kind of saying, you know, this notion of uh, the revolution of smiles or Tharat al Ibtisam, mm. maybe there's no more Ibtisam left. This is something I've, I've, oh. I've heard. Um, mm. So, no predictions, but um, definitely a bit of stress on the ground. Yeah, I mean, it's been 20 weeks, so people are getting tired. And tomorrow is a big moment, and everybody knows it, the government knows it. So, is it a turning point? You never know, it's a revolution. It could be a turning point. What is uh, absolutely certain is that the time is critical because of the, it's the 5th of July. It's also the end of the academic year, which means that the, the, the students who are essential to the movement will go back to their families, will leave Algiers, will leave the big cities. Mm-hmm. And this comes with risks, but also, um, I mean, something that is essential in every social movement on, on a revolutionary uh, moment is that you have to rethink your mobilization and clearly, at this very moment, it's about rethinking the, the revolution and also uh, starting to um, propose some kind of concrete alternative to the regime because we have seen, and I think the Algerian people knows better than everybody, that the regime is not able to come up with an alternative by itself. It's not able to offer any kind of political settlement. Therefore, it's up to uh, the Algerian political elite to come up with a political settlement. And tomorrow is the big protest, but uh, Saturday is this national conference organized by uh, organizations of the civil society and various political parties. And I think that what will come out of this conference will be essential. You know, I mean, a bit more about the future of Algeria. Uh, The question is, do they go for uh, another presidential election or do they uh, demand a more radical change and a new constitution? I think that right now the, the, the political oppositions are divided and what is going to happen Saturday will be essential to understand what is the next step, at least at this level of the political uh, elites. You guys are amazing. This is like in a really nice primer in Algeria. Before <laughs> we say goodbye, Kylie and Noah would are you, are you motivated or uh, anything instigate you to ask anything before we close? I was kind of wondering, um, sorry, I No, no, don't be quiet. I was just, this is an ignorant question based on the fact that I don't follow North Africa very closely. But in Egypt, uh, there was a lot of grassroots, uh, say like YouTube accounts mm-hmm. and dissemination accounts of that sort. Are there? Uh, key figures that do that in the Algerian mm. revolution now? Yeah. I mean... Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I would... I guess is my question. I would say that a lot of what's been happening is through um, journalists on the ground. Uh, and, for example, I, I got on Twitter after this 22nd of February. I started using Twitter because that's where a lot of the information that was happening. A lot of the kind of Algerian YouTube stars are more kind of comical based. Yeah, they're involved in the... Um, the yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. The, there is like all these figures of like Algerian YouTube have been making very uh, deeply uh, uh, political and critical statements for more than three, four, five years. I mean, the, the daily criticism of the regime was there on social medias, on YouTube, and obviously, I think that they have been, in a way, uh, some of the most vocal. Uh, 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 critics of the regime. But they're more political comedy than they are just uh, political mobilization. The thing is that Algerian humor is very specific. There is always a dose of... um, um, Politics. Politics and absurdity in it. But so this idea of comedy and some kind of kind of tragic representation of the daily life was there on YouTube and they were really good at making a video that was kind of hilarious, but saying something very, very sad about Algeria, mm-hmm. or, or going st- straight to the tragic, between two hilarious videos. Mm-hmm. So this is something that is kind of characteristic of Algerian humor, uh, uh, and that is uh, extremely efficient, and that was there before the, the, the beginning of the revolution. And that two of the kind of major sites of 
protest in terms of the youth have been you know soccer stadiums and chants and um, rappers and musicians and mm. so this is also that kind of YouTube generation mm. and I think that's yeah. something that's really astonished people is and including Algerians is seeing um, the youth on the streets after having really okay. had discourses about them being hatiste, you know, they're, they're unemployed, they're not doing anything, and ignoring the really years and years of student activism. But again, as Thomas said, that's been really fragmented, often for a single issue, and has in no way kind of come together like this. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's, yeah, I think that that, that has been... Mm -hmm. And I would add that <laughs> online there is another <laughs> thing that is that was essential, is all these satirical websites like El Manchar, yeah. that we were speaking about the absurdity of daily life in Algeria, but these websites uh, 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 presenting some kind of hilarious uh, chronicles of Algerian politics and systematically mocking the president, the, the, the prime minister and all these jokers have been, I mean, active for a decade now, and, and they are excellent. Just to give and one example, when um, there had been some fake news circulating that Jamila Bouhered, which is one of, one of the historical mujahidat who had you know, been involved in the milk bar attacks in the Battle of Algiers, um, they had said that she actually was not, the official news said she actually wasn't a mujahida. She had not really played an important role in the war. And El Manchar came out with uh, breaking news, not only that, but Bouhered never left her kitchen from mm. 54 to 62, right? Uh -huh. I mean, so they really, uh, they've really been amazing and every time yes, there's a kind of slip up by the regime that's gone a little bit too far um, they've come yeah, back with just a hilarious hilarious reproach yeah and and on the Jadalia Maghrib page we published uh, a piece on uh, jokes mm -hmm. wonderful yeah, yeah wonderful uh, piece if you can address that quickly if you don't mind either of you and then you uh, we were uh, we're working you're working on a glossary so if you can close with that, and I, I apologize, I, uh, I didn't see Jihan uh, behind me who is from uh, Turkey, because the Turks have uh, also their own students. They also so colonized Algeria. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's true. What about your girls? Yeah, do you have anything do you to say with the Ottoman Empire in Algeria? We have two colonizers uh, among us. And then Noah, so if you'd like to ask right after this, please feel free, but if you can address those. I mean, Humor has been a way to cope with the, the black decade. Humor has been a way to cope with the daily, the poverty of life under Bouteflika. And no humor is, has been weaponized as a way to destroy the legitimacy of the regime. As I said, the regime has no legitimacy. It's because uh, it has been extremely clumsy and there is a, a form of uh, inability to articulate your ideas in a way that can convince anybody. So when your, the daily life becomes this like endless series of jokes, uh, I think that it's, it's a form of self-defense. And Algerians came to, to master this art in self-defense when it comes to humor. And sometimes, I mean, I, I'm not a specialist of Algerian humor for the simple reason that I sometimes I'm just puzzled. The sense of humor is, I don't get it. I just don't get it. But it's... Uh, so it's biting. It's it's a way to systematically make sense of the cruelty of your daily life in a way that suddenly um, turns all of this into I don't know uh, some kind of very deep social criticism. And sometimes I feel that sociology is not as powerful, or political science is not as powerful. And and well, it makes sense. I mean. Making jokes might be the best way to show that the king is actually naked. And you end up with like the best protest ever and the best signs ever, precisely because the king is naked and it's pretty fun to say it in out loud. This is Did you want to address the glossary? My yeah. final statement. Or is ah, this the glossary? Sure. Um, I think one one of the powerful things that has come out of these protests is a kind of re um, is a, is a, I won't say discovery, but really a, a, a desire to uphold Derija as a language um, of protest, as a language of humor, as a language of contestation. And for a long time, Algerians were told, you don't, you know, you're Algerian, Arabic is not Arabic. And the slogan of the revolution, you know, comes out of this moment where somebody speaking in Fossa on the streets of Algiers who doesn't actually understand what's happening is saying to a young man, you know, la bl'arabiya, bl'arabiya. 
And the guy says to her, you know, You know, this is our Arabic. I, do, I don't speak Arabic. And there is this moment of um, Algerians kind of saying, uh, this is our language and, and being proud of that. And so the glossary um, is a way to capture some of the humor and some of the kind of use of Darija, which um, is not evident to those who have not been learning Darija, which is most of the people mm. in the world. And even those who have spent time in Algeria, my Darija is not great. I can kind of get by. Mm. Um, and making that, you know, making a gl making a glossary of Darija is a political statement in of itself. It's mm. saying that this is a language that deserves to be documented, studied, understood. Um, and we don't care if people in Lebanon and Jordan don't understand us. This is our language. And so um, it's both a way to capture the kind of historical imaginary, the humor, but also the, um, the investment in Derija as a language, as a national kind of language, which I think is really beautiful. And we might look out for this to come out somehow. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, any, any questions from the uh, uh, others? Noah and uh, Jan? Okay. No, it's been a pleasure to Place to edit, so, I think. so yeah, I'd back to you, no. Okay, well, uh, thank you so much. Thanks. I, I really appreciate. I mean, this was, frankly, a wonderful encapsulated discussion that illuminates so much about Algerians' relations. We would love to sort of connect with you in the future, maybe in the same format where we sure. all travel to Paris and and have this conversation mm -hmm. at the Sorbonne. Yeah, yeah. in this room. Thank, thank you so much. We'll figure out the next time. Okay, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Deal. Thank thanks, you, Mr. Sam.